May 15th, 2006, was two days before Aju Iroaga's 26th birthday, but he was nowhere festive. He had returned to Canada early from a family trip to Nigeria, where both his parents had been born, to begin a summer job for the A&M Reforestation Agency, which was based in Sudbury, Ontario. His actual work site, however, was far more remote. He was working as a tree planter, based in a camp five miles west of the small town of White River, Ontario. The sites he was working at, planting jack pine and black spruce seedlings, were more than 40 miles further out into the wilderness from the camp. The environment was cool, damp, and isolated. The work was physically demanding and taxing. Aju had spent the previous summer doing the same job, so he was prepared for the atmosphere and the hard work. A third-year engineering student at McMaster University, he worked this job to finance his education, something he took very seriously. This year was not going as successfully as his first year, however. May 15th was only Aju's second day of work for the year, and it opened with his arguing with his supervisor on the bus ride from base camp out to the day's remote work site. Aju spent the morning planting a track of seedlings, but got into another disagreement with his supervisor when the crew took a break for lunch around noon. Aju's supervisor told him that he had done a poor job and would need to replant the entire track of seedlings he had spent the morning planting. Aju disagreed and took offense to the notion that, as someone who is very detail-oriented and had spent the entire previous summer doing the same task, he had done sloppy work. Aju was so angry that he quit his job, effective immediately. Aju asked for a ride back to the base camp so that he could collect his things and prepare to go back to his home in Toronto. He was told that no one could give him a ride back to camp and that he would have to wait until 6 p.m. to ride the bus back with the rest of the crew when they finished work for the day. He was told to wait at the intersection of two remote gravel logging roads until he could travel back with the rest of the crew. He was seen waiting there by at least 10 other workers throughout the afternoon, the last time being at 3.45. At 4.05, someone passed the intersection, but Aju was no longer there. Sometime in those 20 minutes, Aju vanished. He has not been seen since. There were no clues of any sort left at the intersection, suggesting what may have become of Aju. After Aju's crew headed back to camp without him at 6 p.m., Supervisors from A&M Reforestation drove up and down the logging roads around where he was last seen, honking their horns and calling his name. At 9 p.m., the Ontario Provincial Police, out of White River, were called. They did not arrive to the base camp until 11 p.m., when it was too dark for them to search the woods. They therefore took a few notes and called the emergency response team to prepare for a search in the morning. Two A&M supervisors spent the night in a truck near the intersection where Aju had last been seen. The search the next day involved two police helicopters, one volunteer helicopter, 18 members of the emergency response team, seven volunteers from the city of Sault Ste. Marie, and three Ontario Provincial Police canine units, also from Sault Ste. Marie. The search ran until early in the evening, but found no evidence of Aju or any leads to follow. With the day's search being unsuccessful, the decision was made to contact Aju's family. At 2 a.m. on May 17th, Aju's 26th birthday, Aju's parents received a phone call telling them that their youngest son was missing. Aju's father, Nawab, made it to the camp on May 19th, and Aju's brother was able to join him the following day. At the base camp, they were given Aju's possessions. These included basic items, like the clothing he had brought with him for the summer, but also items that seemingly eliminated any hope that Aju had somehow made it back to camp and then headed home. In Aju's camp locker had been his wallet, his driver's license, his phone card, his social insurance card, and both his Canadian and Nigerian passports. The search for Aju in the wilderness went on for a week, but was called off on May 22nd, having found absolutely nothing. Within a few weeks of Aju going missing, his case was considered open but inactive by the Ontario Provincial Police. Since no sign of Aju, or a potential path he may have taken, was found in the woods, it has been the belief of his family that he was somehow taken out of the area. This could have occurred in several different scenarios. 
In some of these scenarios, Aju left the area willingly, and in some, he did not. Aju was in excellent physical shape and was a trained distance runner, known to sprint along 18 miles of the logging roads each morning before being sent out to plant trees. It would not necessarily be impossible for him to have traveled on foot the 40 miles along the access road that would take him to the Trans-Canada Highway to try to hitchhike, either back to camp or to some other destination of his choosing. That being said, if he planned to do that, why did he wait four hours to start the journey? By that time, waiting for the bus directly back to the base camp, where he would have had to go to retrieve his documents, would have been much quicker. It was also beginning to get dark at four o'clock, making the foot journey much more dangerous than it would have been if he had left midday. Even assuming that Aju did get impatient and tried to make it out of the woods on his own, he either got lost on the way, met with foul play at the hands of someone who gave him a ride, or successfully got out of the remote area and went off to start a new life in secret. The first scenario seems unlikely, given the complete lack of evidence and the extensive search. The second is possible, but as of now has no supporting evidence, and the third has its own set of problems. Audrey was very close with his family, and would not have put them through the heartache of not knowing where he was willingly. While this is a sentiment often expressed when a person goes missing, it is a sentiment, and hard to evaluate or prove objectively. In Aju's case, however, there are solid facts that discredit this theory. Aju did have a desire to dramatically change his living situation. Aju had expressed interest in returning to live in Nigeria because of the calming effect being in the village of his father's birth had on his mental health. He was also highly respected in the village. The village did not have running water, and during the times Aju spent there, he would leave early in the mornings with a wheelbarrow to collect water in a nearby stream for the elderly and infirm. Since Aju's dream of starting over was so specific, it is easier to evaluate if he decided to abandon his current life willingly. If Aju decided to make his dream a reality after quitting his job, he would have needed to go back to the camp to get his passports in order to travel internationally. Since he could not hitchhike or walk to Africa, he would also have needed money for a plane ticket, but his bank accounts were not touched after he went missing. Given that Aju also had extended family back in Nigeria, and his immediate family traveled there regularly, he would have been discovered, even if he did somehow covertly make it back to his father's village. The Oroaga family's dual ties to both Nigeria and Canada began in 1968, when Aju's father Nwab came to Canada from Nigeria to study at the University of Waterloo. His plan was to bring his wife and infant daughter there after he was settled, but a civil war in Nigeria escalated soon after he arrived in Canada, and threatened his dreams of reuniting with them. After more than a year of not being able to contact his family, Nwab was finally able to bring them to Canada. The Oroagas then had four more children, with Aju being the youngest, and Nwab ultimately became a college professor. The family divided their time between Canada and Nigeria. These stretches in each country could span several years. Aju attended primary school in Nigeria and struggled to adapt when the family returned to Canada. He was taunted in his junior high school outside of Toronto for his accent and his slender build, and he told his parents he wanted to return to Nigeria. The stress ultimately impacted his behavior. At first, he became withdrawn, but then he developed a temper. He got into a violent altercation with a classmate over a basketball while he was in high school. Following this incident, Audrey redirected all of his energy into excelling academically. This plan worked, both because it contained his temper and also because it got him offers of admission to multiple universities. His temper did get out of control again in his second year at McMaster, when he got into a fight with another student in his dorm after a disagreement. Aju ended up spending a month in prison. Again, he took responsibility for his actions and took steps to prevent such behavior in the future. He took anger management classes, began practicing yoga, and started eating a vegetarian diet in hopes of improving his coping skills. This was also when he began running more seriously, as well as composing music, to give himself new outlets for his emotions and energy. Aju's supervisor managed to get through all these defenses Aju had built up and bring out some of his temper. However, despite the fact that Aju got into these arguments the day he disappeared, 
his behavior does seem to show that his anger management skills were improving. While quitting his job may seem rash, it can also be argued that it was a good decision for Audrey to make. If he and his supervisor were going to continue to argue all summer, it may have been best for Audrey to remove himself from the situation before tension could build to the point where he would lash out. Furthermore, Audrey seemed calm according to those who saw him standing at the intersection for those four hours just prior to his disappearance. He even reportedly waved or gave a thumbs up to one of his supervisors during this time he was waiting, indicating that his mood had calmed. However, this analysis is based on what the company says happened the day Audrey disappeared, based on notes from the company's supervisors. All of the information we have about the day Audrey disappeared is potentially suspect. It is possible that the argument escalated at the work site, or was rekindled several hours later as Audrey was waiting by the road, and resulted in Audrey meeting with foul play. The company's account perhaps should be looked at with some skepticism when viewed through the context of when and how it was recorded, and when and how the investigation into Audrey's disappearance was handled as a whole. The only reason for any sort of investigation into Audrey's disappearance after May of 2006 was the dedicated efforts of the Oroaga family and the private investigators they hired in June 2006. The position of the Ontario Provincial Police from the beginning was that Audrey had wandered off and gotten lost in the woods, and they did not perform any of the basic investigative tasks normally performed in a missing persons case, where any number of scenarios could have resulted in the disappearance of the individual. There were no photos taken at the work site, the site was not searched, the names of the other members of Audrey's crew were not so much as recorded, and the witnesses in the case were not interviewed. The supervisor Aju had gotten into the fights with on the day he disappeared was not even interviewed by police until October 2007, almost a year and a half after Aju vanished. In this interview, she claimed to have not argued with Aju at all on the day he vanished. This was a striking reversal of the previous narrative of May 15, 2006, but one the police accept as fact. The Ontario Provincial Police have resisted the attempts of the Oroagas to have the case reactivated, stating that they will not move forward with the case unless new information is discovered, indicating that a crime was committed in it. Almost all of that potential evidence was lost the day Aju disappeared, when they chose not to try to collect it. In 2008, the Oroaga family publicly appealed to the provincial government of Ontario to open a coroner's inquest into Aju's case and for a new search in an extended area. They believe the initial search was not carried out in the correct area, which is why no sign of their son was found. They also called for the Ministry of Labor to investigate the safety practices of the reforestation firms that recruited university students. These efforts did not result in any advancement in Aju's case. While Aju's parents believe that their son is no longer alive, they struggle with the lack of answers about what happened to him. They hope to one day be able to provide their youngest child with a proper burial.